Good morning, everybody. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Post-Gazette, joined by Paul Zeiss, our Post-Gazette Sports Columnist for our weekly Zeiss is Right video. Paul, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing today, Adam? I am doing well. The big news that we need to touch on before we go anywhere is Alex Highsmith's extension um, signed on Wednesday. So this is a, our first chance to kind of react to the deal. I believe it was five years uh, 70 million officially. The the numbers can get jostled around a little bit, but that is the headline number being reported by our Jerry Dulac at the Post Gazette. Um, before I get Paul's opinion on that, just want to remind you all of our Steelers coverage here on the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and our podcast network is brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Uh, we'll talk about them a little bit more in a little bit, but just give a shout out to them at the top of the show. Thank you for supporting our show. Paul, what is your reaction to the extension? It's it's a lot of money. Um, it's It's more... I think it's a little bit more than I was expecting him to sign for. But what 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 do you what's your takeaway from the deal to lock this guy down for for the long term here across from TJ Watt? Well, I mean, I think the extension obviously it should be clarified a little bit because you know we throw these numbers out there. But the extension is actually four years, sixty what sixty four million, I think is what it is. Uh, he's playing on a sick his his last year. It's six million dollars this year. Then next year the extension will kick in. So that's where they come up with the number 70 over five years. But it's really, uh, and, and, and you know, so basically for the next five years, he's going to be playing for an average of $14 million a year, although it's going to be closer to $17 million a year, you know, once it kicks in. Um, I think that's what you pay, you know. That's kind of the going rate for a guy like him. And what we've seen, I think the only thing that I would tell you is a little bit concerning is what we've seen is, you know, he's a different player when T.J. Watt's not in, in the lineup. Um, uh, and so, um, to me, that being said, um, as long as TJ Watt stays healthy and, and, and is, is productive and is, does what he does, they're going to get their money out of Alex Highsmith. You know, he's going to make plays for them. He's going to make, he's going to sack, he's going to put pressure on quarterbacks, uh, because that's what he's shown he will do if, T.J. Watt's in the lineup. Now, when T.J. Watt's not in the lineup, it's a little different. But you know what? It's a little different for everybody else on, on that team. I think Alex Heisman is a pretty good player. Um, I think he's productive enough. Uh, it, it makes sense. You, you basically have now locked in your, your two edge rushers for you know the for foreseeable future. And, and let's face it, Adam, um, the way the game is played on defense, your edge rushers and your corners are probably your two most important positions. Yeah, and you've, you've got those locked down for the next couple of years. Paul, you mentioned the production. If, if you get the production, what does that look like for you, assuming T.J. Watt is healthy? Last year, I have his numbers here uh, pulled up. He had 15 sacks, 35 hurries, five hits for a total of uh, 55 pressures on opposing quarterbacks. But the year before, he was at 35 pressures, eight sacks, eight hits, and 19 hurries. Does he have to be at least somewhere between those two numbers? Let's say, you know, 40-ish total her, uh, total pressures and maybe 10 sacks to, to justify that? Or does he have to be closer to the player that he was last season where, I, you know, he was in a lot of ways kind of the lead pass rusher because you missed, um, you know, T.J. Watt for large swaths of the season? I, I would say 12, 12 sacks minimum. He's got to get to the 12 sacks kind of a random number but the but but 12 once you get above 12 now you're really somebody that's affecting games um you know i i would say i would like to see that number between 55 and 65 total pressures um because now you're talking about three when i'm almost four a game really if you think about it um that's what he probably needs to do to really justify what he is capable of and also justify what they're going to pay him do you think that's what they're going to get from him considering we only really saw that version of Alex Highsmith once and it was not necessarily the guy he was in his first couple of years? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, Bud Dupree, when he was, you know, when he was in a contract year, went crazy. And I think it's probably safe to say he hasn't come close to that since. Um, you know, last year was technically a contract year for Alex Highsmith. So, I understand the concern, but I, I kind of feel like Alex Highsmith is a, is, is a better player than Bud Dupree was. I kind of feel like Alex Highsmith is a guy that, you know, um, is probably going to continue to get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And again, I think if, if TJ Watt is healthy, 
teams have to do so many different things to try and account for T.J. Watt. Alex Highsmith should have a lot of opportunities to go out and make plays. He really should. So I, I would tell you that I think that Alex Highsmith is a guy uh, that is probably going to give you that kind of production, assuming he stays healthy, which, you know, I think he will. I mean, he's been pretty durable. So, yeah, why not? I mean, I, I, I don't see a downside here from the standpoint of I don't think he's going to get all that money and, uh, and run away and hide, you know, like some people think. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think he's going to be fine. I think he's going to get, uh, you know, he's going to be a guy who, who gets a lot done uh, in terms of, um, you know, production. The big criticism on social media so far, Paul, seems to be that they're spending a ton of money on defense. This is, you know, another big extension to go with Minka Fitzpatrick, to go with T.J. Watt. Cam Hayward's still making a lot of money. Um what do you say to that criticism, Paul, that they're putting too much money in, into that side of the ball? What m My view is they don't have a lot of guys on the offensive side of the ball that you have to invest a lot of money in. You guys got guys on, on rookie deals, um, you know, Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, Najee Harris, and those are the big three spots. You got Broderick Jones, your left tackle, locked up on a rookie deal. You spent a little bit of money on the offensive line at the places where you needed to. Deontay Johnson was a guy that you, you got that deal done. Um you know, I just don't see where people want them to be spending money <laughs> on what was available in this free agent market. I'll put it in perspective for you, Adam. I added up the salaries of Mason Rudolph, Mitch Trubisky, and Kenny Pickett. Okay? So all three of their quarterbacks, their entire quarterback room, they make about $4 million less than Jordan Love will make this year. And Jordan Love is only making about $13 million, 13.4 or something. So, in other words, wh what are people think? If, if two years from now, Kenny Pickett is the guy that some people think he can be or we think, you know, he might be, guess what? They're going to have to, you know, spend $35, $40 million. And, and let's face it, that's the going rate right now. I think Daniel Jones got $40 million. Two years from now, who knows what it's going to be? I mean, uh, Lamar Jackson's making $55 million. You know, the, the going rate is going to be about 40 to 45 maybe even a little bit more for Kenny Pickett if he is who we think he is, right? Okay, well, now if you have to pay your quarterback 45 or $50 million, guess what? Now you can't spend all this money that you're spending on defense. But by that point, you know, who knows? You might be, you know, Cam Hayward might be done, which take his numbers off the books, right, two years from now, right? T.J. Watt might be a guy they have to move on from, depending on what happens with his body. If his body breaks down and he's not as productive, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can move money around. But for the most part, for the next two years, you have the luxury of spending as much money as you want to on defense uh, because, as you said, they have a, a a rookie who, if he is who he, you know, they think he is when they drafted him. Your left tackle is going to cost you basically almost the league minimum, you know, not not much more. Okay, I mean, for four years, that's that's reality. You're going to have him on a deal similar to what Kenny Pickett. Well, if your left tackle and your quarterback don't cost you, you know, an arm and a leg, which the Steelers, you know, really in the grand scheme of things, are extremely cheap. And it, not because they're cheap, not because they don't want to pay them, but they got them on rookie deals. There's no – this is the dumbest – this is this is one of those things, narrative, uh, uh, Adam, where we start with a narrative. It's an offensive league, and the Steelers are putting all their money in defense. Well, that's because all of their established veterans are on defense. All of their stars right now are on defense. But, you know, in a couple of years, Pat Fryermuth probably is going to have to get paid. I think he's still on his rookie deal, isn't he? Or very, uh, yeah, he's got another one. Year. Yeah, he's, he's on his rookie deal. And so if you don't get a deal done with him, Paul, you have Darnell Washington on a rookie deal. I mean, there's, there's just right. so many guys that you can name. Broderick Jones is on his rookie deal, obviously, for the next four years. Kenny Pickett's on for at least another two years. you got on his rookie deal. And if you really want to push it one more year, you know what? You can you can uh, exercise the, uh, the fifth-year option on him. So, I mean, my point is they have got enough, I mean, uh, players. I mean, Najee Harris is still on his rookie deal, I think, right? Isn't he? I mean, what we're talking about, what are we talking about? They, it's, not, it's not like they don't have 
good players on offense. It just so happens that all of them are on, you know, their rookie deals and aren't making a lot of money. So you can afford now if you're the Chiefs and you're paying Patrick Mahomes 45 million and Kelsey, I think, is making what, 18 million or whatever he's making. And you know, that's different. It's a completely different animal. Um, you know, if you're the if you're the Ravens now and you're paying your quarterback 55 million and you pay, I think they're paying one of their tackles and is making, you know, uh, uh near the top uh dollar there, I mean. It's a different animal when you've got sixty million dollars or seventy-five, you know, seventy million dollars invested in two players on one side of the ball. Yeah, but that's not the case with the Steelers. So to me, uh, every time I read it, I want to take my, I, I want to take my forehead right here and this wooden desk I'm sitting at, right? I want to smash it into this desk because it's like you're not paying attention. You're, 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 you're basically, uh, you're basically. Uh, 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 running a, a narrative out there that in a lot of cases might fit. It doesn't fit here. It doesn't fit here because they're not paying their quarterback anything. I mean, Kenny Pickett's making $3 million a year. Do you, did you think that the Ravens paying, I think it's $55 million, I think, or, is, or maybe it's $51 million or whatever it is. The Ravens paying $51 million to Lamar Jackson. The Steelers paying $3 million to Kenny Pickett. Do you think that $48 million can be used on defense and elsewhere <laughs> that the Ravens don't have to spend? Yeah, I will throw out one devil's advocate here, Paul, and I'm not saying this is necessarily something I'm arguing, but DeAndre Hopkins just signed a deal this week. I thought it was a pretty reasonable deal. He's a guy that could have helped the Steelers receiving core. Definitely, even in his later years, I think is more proven than anything that they have. Um <laughs> I think that is where people would say you could have spent money on that. I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you need Alex Highsmith, and this is partly going to be about what we get into here, about what did the Steelers have behind Alex Highsmith, and if you didn't make that deal, what were your options on the other side of T.J. Watt? That, that's my big concern. But some people might say, hey, wouldn't this offense look a lot better with a guy like DeAndre Hopkins leading that receiving core? Of course, but here's the thing. There was nothing about this deal that just took place that would prohibit the Steelers from signing DeAndre Hopkins. I mean, there's probably a, a lot of other factors as to why Hopkins is not here. Um, this deal has nothing to do with why he's not here. So, I mean, I, yes. Could they use another playmaker or somebody like that? Absolutely. But I don't know that this deal prohibits them from doing that because, again, they've got so much flexibility with their rookies and their young guys on offense. They just None of them are making any money. Even Deontay Johnson, really, in the grand scheme of things, isn't making that much money. Um, you know, that's just how it is. Two years from now, Adam, we'll be sitting here, you know, Lord willing and the crick don't rise, we'll be silly, sitting here doing one of these things, right? And uh, and we, we're going to be talking about, okay, what kind of moves you're going to have to make to accommodate Kenny Pickett, you know, uh, going from four million or five million or whatever he's going to make next, you know, in the next couple of years. I don't know what the escalation is, but let's say six million, right, or whatever. We're going to have to talk about him going from six million to say forty-six million. Okay, now we're going to have an interesting conversation about, you know, how you're going to, you know, make that kind of money available, especially since by then you probably will have. Signed or locked up Pat Fryermuth. I don't know that you have locked up Najee Harris, but you know uh, who knows. The, you know, at the end of the day, you look at what you are spending on offense. It's because you've got so many guys on their first contract. Yeah, I agree. And here's the thing too, Paul, uh, I want to get into this a little bit. There's no one else here that's really proven that they can come anywhere close to being what Alex Highsmith is. The Marvin Leal, Isaiah Loudermilk. I mean, these guys have not in any way proven that they could be the next guy in that spot. And and I think right. that is that is part of why this deal is necessary, Paul, is that these these pass rushers are not like dime a dozen anymore. Like It's, it's hard to get them. It's hard to get, get guys who are as effective as you need them to be in today's NFL. It's the, most important position on defense at this point in time. So I, I guess my have a twofold question for you here, Paul. How much pressure should be on guys like DeMarvin Leal, who they spent a the third-round pick on, Isaiah Loudermilk, who a lot of people thought could have been a fourth-round pick that they snagged in the in the fifth, to step up, A, and B, 
how does this affect the draft calculus? Is next year? Do we look go go into next year looking at you know pass rusher as as a big need to kind of have that next wave of guys starting to get going? So maybe you don't need to sign a deal like this um, again. Well, I would say one a couple things. First of all, Adam, as you know, the Steelers for their offense to or their defense <coughs> for their defense to work. They've always needed to have two high-level pass rushers. That's one thing they've always had on the outside, two guys that can put a lot of pressure on quarterbacks from either side of the ball, from either, either side. So you, you had to sign him because you needed him um, to make your defense complete. The second thing is, and this is the most important thing to me, right, those guys you're talking about, one of them has to emerge because, again – you can't realistically think Highsmith and, and Water are going to stay healthy for you know 17 games each. There's going to be some games where you're going to have to play with some of those guys on you know starting and playing a lot of the snaps because the other guys are hurt. So when you look at it that way, I'll be honest with you, I I can't I can't say that even going into next year. Next year, I think they should use a, a you know a pick on a pass rusher because. Uh, I don't think they have a third legitimate option, number one. And number two, they always need to have two of these guys for their defense really to work the way it works. So that's where I would look at it. From that standpoint, it feels to me like one of these guys that they've drafted, one of these young guys, this has to be the year they really step up and show, hey, I can be that next sort of guy. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll never be that next 1A but I can be that next, you know, uh, three, which, you know, if, if either of our 1A guy or 1A or 1B, if either of those guys are out and you put me in there for four or five games or eight games or whatever, I can be productive. They need to show that. And if they don't show that, I would not have any problem at all with them drafting another guy who is a pass rusher because it's such an important part of what they do. Yeah, and I have an article. I will include the link to it down in the description out today on the Post Gazette website. Uh, basically, looking at PFF grades from last season, and Demarvin Lee Allen and Isaiah Loudermilk were two of the worst guys on the team. And I think if the Steelers are going to move forward, they need those guys to be a lot better. Uh, Paul, I want to get into the Buckos, but before we do, just want to give a quick shout out to Pella uh, Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella windows and doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give us a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella windows and doors of Pittsburgh. Paul, with that out of the way, it's, it's time to talk some pirates um, we're recording this on Wednesday afternoon. I'm uh, not exactly sure what's going on in the Pirates game right now, but it's it's been bad regardless of whether they win this Wednesday <laughs> game or not, Paul. Monday was like the air flowing directly out of the balloon um, when Quinn Priester had a nice start first three innings, um, you know, was was inducing ground balls and looked like, looked like he might be able to hang. And then those next handful of innings, Paul, he got bombed. And right. Um, were you surprised, I guess, is, is my big question for you about Quinn Priester, because I looked at, at his his numbers in the International League. He had an ERA approaching the mid fours. He had a whip, which is, uh, you know, hits and, and walks per inning pitched um, that was, I think, approaching 1.4. That's a terrible number, Paul. That's too many base runners. Um, I guess I, I, I was not surprised to see that that was the guy that they called up because he wasn't really thriving in AAA either. Well, again, at some point you got to find out if the guy can pitch for you, you know. Um, and that's not to say there's some magical formula. If he comes up to the majors, he's going to do well. Uh, but you you got to see if he can be your guy. I think one of the things the Pirates have done way too way wrong in my in my estimation. One of the things they've done way too wrong, they have waited way too long for some of these guys. Right, they've left them in the minors. They keep waiting for them. Oh, when they need more at bats, they need this. They need to show this. They need to show that. I think at some point, you know what? We need to know if we need. You know, if I'm the Pirates, we need to know if we've got a pitcher here. If we don't, okay. And his minor league numbers haven't been great. I get it, but 
he was drafted high. He's a pedigree guy, allegedly. And so to me, in this second half of the season, and this is where I'm going to go with, you know, people losing their minds about them losing and things of the such. In this second half of the season, I want to find out who they have and who they don't have. I don't care if they lose. I don't care if they lose 100 games, Adam. I really don't. Now, if we see a bunch of games like we've seen the last two nights, <laughs> you know, where they just are a total embarrassment, that's different. But if they're losing because they just don't have quite enough or they're you know, not quite experienced enough or whatever – but I want to see is Nick Gonzalez the guy that can play second base for the for the Pirates in the next you know ten years or eight years or however long he's going to be around, right? You got to see it. I want to see if Quinn Priester can be a pitcher. So it, it, you're asking me, did it shock me? Not at all. It didn't shock me because I didn't have any expectations for him. I, I, I know that he struggled a little bit. I know that he struggled uh, in, in my in the minors. I know that he's not a guy like Skeens who's got a power arm and all that other stuff, and so. You know, he's going to have to learn how to pitch. But apparently he's got very good control. And, you know, when he's when he's hitting in spots, he can, he can be very, very effective. Let's see if he can do it in the major league. So um, it, it didn't shock me that he got through three innings. And, then of course, after everyone saw him one time, they started teeing off on him. Now you hope the next time he pitches, maybe he can stretch out the four, four and four, you know, a little bit more, you know, four innings, or you know, and get to the point where he can get through six innings effectively. Okay, now you've got somebody that you can say, all right, here we have somebody for our rotation next year. But, Adam, it, to me, everybody that's yelling and screaming about their wins and losses at this point, now that they brought all these young guys up, you're, you're, you're focused on the wrong things. Can these guys play or not is the only thing I really care about for this point going forward. Well, I will throw this out there, Paul. At some level, doesn't don't those two things have to come together? Don't you have to win some games to prove that you got guys who are good enough to be here? Um, and, and I think that's that's my big concern of watching those games, not just the past two nights, but on this losing streak they've been on since Henry Davis has been here, since Nick Gonzalez has been here. Um, you know, th- none of these guys, Paul, have come up and kind of been – they haven't been Ellie De La Cruz, and I'm not asking them to be that. I mean, that's that's historic in baseball terms. But they haven't really done anything to generate the excitement that we have been sold here for the last four years since Ben Charrington has has been hired. They're they're not they're not coming close to matching the hype, Paul. It's not it's not just a matter of they're not getting all the way there. They're not coming close, and I think that's my big concern. Is if you're not seeing some more wins than we've seen since basically the end of April, then I think it's fair to question whether these guys can play. True, but uh, my point is I- improvement might be steady, slow, but steady, you know, and to me, that's that's the key. Are they getting better? Are they improving? Are they getting better at bats? Are they doing, you know what I mean? Is Henry Davis getting better in right field? Uh, these are all things that have to be measured, and guess what? If they are improving, to your point, they'll start winning some games. I'm not saying they're going to go out and go 20-8 and eight again, but I think they'll start winning some games, and, and it'll show. Uh, But that's why I wrote yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday in in the Post-Gazette, I wrote a column that basically said, you know what, Monday night against Cleveland, the clock has officially started on Ben Charrington. Because now, it's all his guys for the most part, right? I mean, there's there's a few. And you can say, well, Brian Reynolds was here. Yeah, but you know what, he just extended Brian Reynolds. So he's his guy. Uh, You know, Quinn Priester, yeah, he was drafted by Huntington, but guess who? Guess what? For the last four years, he's been developing under uh, 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 Charrington's watch. So he's his guy, too, in, in, in my book. Uh, all of these guys now are Ben Charrington's guys for the most part. Okay, you got me. Uh, McCutcheon isn't, but guess what? He signed McCutcheon, so I'm going to throw him in there, too, because he made the decision to sign McCutcheon. The same thing with the manager. He made the decision to uh, uh, extend the manager. So now you've got about 80 games or whatever it is left this year. And I would say, you know, a lot of next year. And if it's not working by this time next year, you got to move on. You got to clean house at your front office because guess what? They've either drafted a whole bunch of bad players. They've signed, you know, they've traded for a whole bunch of bad players like Contreras or, Whatever they're doing to develop players isn't isn't working. It's terrible. 
You know, and so, you know, it, 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 it's got to start in my mind. It's a symbolic move in some ways, but at some point, Derek Shelton has to be fired. I, I you, Especially if this continues. You cannot go four years in a row, essentially, with 100 lost teams. I don't care what hand you're dealt, okay? But it's got to go much deeper than that. It, you know, at the end of this year, if we don't see improvement from these guys, Adam, if we see this circus continuing like we've seen the last two nights, I got to be honest with you. I clean house scouting department. I clean house on all of my minor league instructors, on all of my you know uh, minor league directors, my who guys who run the draft. You know, all, you know Oscar Marin, you know uh, Andy Haynes, all of them got to go. Clean house, and let's see if you can find a, a better formula. Uh, and that's not to say all these guys are responsible or all these guys are bad baseball people, but at the end of the day, it, it, and it all comes back to what you said, at the end of the day, if it's not translating into wins, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think I, I almost feel like we're like memory holing here, Paul, that we were talking about this team winning 75 games this year. And now I believe they're on a 69 win pace as of today. That would be a seven game improvement, which I guess is something. But when you're 20 and eight in April and you have these veteran guys who are kind of leading the charge and I think are still leading the charge in a lot of ways. Connor Joe on Tuesday night was the only guy who scratched across a run because he hit a home run. Carlos Santana hit that walk off home run against Milwaukee, which was one of the few good things that's happened to you, you know, since April. Um, Andrew McCutcheon's like the only truly professional hitter. Those guys are all going to be gone, Paul, except maybe McCutcheon, who they might want to bring back. Um, and then all you're going to be left with is these guys who are just not getting the job done. And so if, if you're looking at 69 wins at the end of the year and you're looking at similar trajectories with these with these young players, I almost wonder if, if you give Charrington another year or if you clean house this year, um, even if, if you keep the general manager, there's got to be, I think, a lot of change because we were talking about much more substantial improvement than what it looks like they're heading toward, Paul. And, and I think 69 wins at this point, that's factoring in an April that I think was aberrational. And they were stealing, what, 20 bases against the Dodgers? <laughs> because of the rule changes, you know, everyone was still adapting. And the Pirates, I think, were well positioned to take advantage of that. But then once everyone adjusted, they've pretty much been the same team they were last season when you can't take that kind of aberrational stuff out of it. I, I would tell you this, Adam, if they don't get the 70 wins, it's a disaster. I don't care if they go from 61 to 69 or 61 to, you know, it, that to me is, and not that 70 is some benchmark, but uh, when you start out with 20 wins in your first 28 games, if you can't get to 70 wins, uh, I, I, you've been so bad down the stretch. Um, and here's the thing. It's not out of, it's not out of the uh, possibility. And frankly, at this point, if you look at the math, it wouldn't even take really that much more of a downturn to get to 100 losses. If you get to 100 losses, Adam, I would tell you this, everybody should be gone. Everybody. They should all be gone, including Terrington. Because, okay, you got to 100 losses, which means you were abysmal for your last 80 or 90 or 100 games. Well, what's going to change that next year? So basically, we'll go into next year and you'll say, well, now this is the year we're going to get to 74, 75 wins. So now you're another year away from, you know, and, and, and so my point is, I, I look at what's going on with this team. When you look at the players that have been uh, the, the guys that have been brought up that were supposed to sort of be the Calvary, right? If they don't show improvement, this year, I'm with you. I don't even know if you bring Shelton uh, Charrington back. You know they will, but you can't bring Shelton back. But 69 wins, 68 wins, that's a disaster at this point. And there are people who say, well, you know, 20 and 8 like you, uh, 20 and 8 was a fluke. Yeah, but you get you got those 20, 20 wins in the, in the bank. They were already in the bank. So, I mean, even if you just played five or six games under 500 the rest of the way, Right, you're getting closer to 80 wins. So uh, I just think that um, that this, what what is going on here, has been such an abject failure um, that that 
if it doesn't turn around and at least they become functional and you can start to say, oh, well, Nick, Nick Gonzalez legitimately, legitimately looks like he can be a second baseman. Henry Davis has gotten better every week as a fielder in right field. Andy Rodriguez is improving as a catcher. Now his bat's starting to come around like what we saw in the minors, right? If you don't start to see those things, boy, I'm not sure how anyone could be optimistic about next year. And if we're not going to be optimistic about next year, right, you might as well pull the Band-Aid off. And 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 I'm not saying start all over because you've built, you know, a lot of young prospects and you got a, a minor league system that apparently has a number of players in it. But – to me, it's clear the philosophies of this general manager are not working. Yeah, I, I think we're teetering very close to that, Paul. And I just think it's important not to let, you know, there's defenders of this franchise that that are out there telling you that things are going in the right direction. And I think I'm starting to see the telegraphing message of, well, it's okay as long as they show growth next year. And they're moving that goalpost from where it was in this spring. <laughs> And I don't right. think I don't think that that should be allowed to happen. I, we can't you can't move the goalpost on this team to like what you were saying earlier. It can't be now you win seventy four or seventy five next year and that's acceptable because that's what you were talking about this year. Um, to be transparent, I said they were going to win seventy because I am skeptical and have been skeptical this whole time, and maybe I'm a little too skeptical at times. But that's you know this has been more or less what what I kind of thought we would see, which is. They're, they're not getting the production from these guys from the minors. They're not developing them. And we haven't seen it. You want to talk about with guys who are like Huntington guys. Well, they had Cole Tucker in the system for how long, Paul? He's a former first-round pick <laughs> that, that is, is gone. Um, they had Travis Swaggerty, who was another guy that they had years and years and years of control of his development. And maybe they didn't want to pick him. Maybe, maybe there were issues. But he was a former first-round pick, and now he's on the DFA list. We don't know – as of when we're recording this, what might happen with him if he ends up, um, you know, staying out right into India or what. But those are two former first-round picks that you got nothing out of, um, regardless of whether they should have been good or, good or bad picks. So that's that's my concern, Paul, is is that, you know, that it's not just, you know, let's we're, we'll wait and see with some of these young guys that are getting here now. They've had young guys on this team for four years and to my mind, the only thing that they've really produced was Mitch Keller, which took them three years to figure out, and Jack Sawinski, who was backslid in the second half again. Exactly. I mean, that's the point. And, and you you know, uh, I, uh, Bob Schmeisek had a really good tweet yesterday about all the first-round picks that have been wasted, that were wasted under Huntington. But a number of them were in the system under Charrington for a number of years and just never got better. So, I mean, yeah, you, you miss on first-round picks, it hurts, but are you missing or are you just developing them poorly? I, I mean, one, one, you know, or in the case of Shane Baz, are you giving them away in a stupid trade? I mean, you could, let's go there, too. Uh, but, 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 but really, you know, if you look at, if you look at the last seven first-round picks of Neil Huntington, I mean, Cabrian Hayes is the best one you got, and I don't know that – I don't know that really he's the guy they thought he was or they thought gave, they were getting. You gave him $70 million, Paul, and you still haven't figured out how to get him to hit. And and right. and I think he's still a useful player. I still like that extension because I think his defense is so good that it will pay off that deal if he's even, you know, just a, a like average hitter. Um, so I still like that deal. I still like its potential, and, and I don't necessarily have a problem with it. But to your point, he signed that extension. Sherrington signed that extension. So he owns what happens to Key Brian Hayes. And I think he owns some of these guys he traded for. I've heard some talk on, on social media that, oh, Tucapita Marcano, uh, Rodolfo Castro, G1 Bay, these guys weren't really part of the plan. They weren't really supposed to be good. They were, you know, they were just, it would just be a bonus if they were good. Even though, you know, six months ago we were being told, oh, these guys are the second middle infielders of the future. It's, it's, right. it's right. just so much goalpost moving going on to defend Ben Charrington. And, and here's the thing, Paul, I don't, I don't know where the results are that justify that. No, for, for him, now, in his career. And, and and speaking of middle infielders, now you've got Pagaro up, you got O'Neill Cruz coming back, you got Nick Gonzalez, you got and, and so you, it, it's good that you got a bunch of them, but you got to solve it and figure it out at some point. And the other part of it is, who is your first baseman of the future? I mean, is and, and I heard someone today suggested it's Triola or whatever his name is, the guy that's playing third uh, for for Hayes a, a lot these days. I mean. <laughs> 
Uh, is that where we're really going to go? Uh, and then, of course, when he's no good or he's, you know, just average, it'll be like, well, you know, he was a stopgap anyway. I mean, at some point, like I said, when you had this master grand plan that you started four years ago and you're starting to see a lot of these guys come up and, and you know, it's got to start coming to fruition or else you failed, period. Yeah, I agree. And, Paul, I'll get you out of here on this. I've seen a lot of people uh, – I think our Ron Cook was one of the people that, that suggested this. He wrote a column – I think it was either late last week or early this week saying the Pirates need more out of Key Brian Hayes and Brian Reynolds. And while I would agree with that sentiment, I think those guys are starting to shoulder blame that to me doesn't make sense considering, you know, I think those guys are both going to settle out being at two and a half, three win players by the end of the year. Um, maybe you'd like to see them be more than that, but the Pirates aren't paying them to be more than that. We're not talking about Andrew McCutcheon here in the form of Brian Reynolds. Yes, he had that really good one year, but I think he's more of a three-win player for the for the long run. He, Brian Hayes is kind of the same way. If he ever really starts to hit, I think he could be a four, five, six-win guy. Maybe he's in some all-star conversations. But again, the Pirates aren't paying him like that. And, and so just because $70 million is a big number in the context of the Pirates does not mean that it's a big number in the context of the industry. And, and I think those guys are starting to shoulder a little bit more blame than maybe they deserve for, for some of the shortcomings elsewhere. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I could see that, but they're the two highest paid players. I mean, they are the guys that, you know, you gave long-term deals to and gave, you know, a lot of money to. And and people, you know, who have been pushing the Pirates to try and do some long-term deals with guys uh, are frustrated because these guys now, you know, these are guys that they gave a long-term deal to and uh, they haven't quite uh, produced like, you know, we think they're going to produce. I agree with you, though. I think Brian Reynolds is what he is. Uh, I've never thought he was a superstar. I've always thought he was just kind of a – a really good player on a, on a, you know, if you've got a couple of stars around him, he's a really good player on a team that you can win with. Um, but he's never going to be that guy. His personality isn't that way. He's not that he's never going to be that guy. You know, um, O'Neill Cruz has a little bit more of that guy in him. Um, but you know, to me, you're right. But those two guys are, are sort of a symbol of, Hey, we finally paid somebody and they haven't gotten it done. That's why the frustration is. Uh, but believe me, They've got a lot bigger problems than Reynolds and 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 uh, and, and, and Cabrian Hayes. Uh, my concern with Hayes long term is his health. Um, he's you know got some you know he's got some things that seem to be chronic wrong with him that you know caused him to not be able to play uh, as many games as he might need to. Uh, but he is what he is. I mean, he's a guy who's probably always going to be a really good glove that is a decent but not great hitter. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Paul, any final thoughts before I let you go here? No, not really. I mean, uh, I, you know, I think we've said it pretty much uh, said it all in terms of, you know, this is a very critical stretch for the next 80 games or whatever it is for, for to me, the future of the Pirates. You know, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to win. It's like they don't have to go 45 and 35 or something like that. But what they do need to do is we need to see by the end of this year some definitive real answers as to, okay, that guy can be that position. That guy can be that position. That guy can be that position. This guy's going to pitch well enough to be in the rotation, you know, and all of those things. Yeah, I agree. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me. We'll be back again next week. Um, and everyone else stay tuned. We'll have the all North Shore drive coming at you on Friday. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I got one other thing, too. We didn't even get into the whole, should they trade David Bednar? We can do that next week because I think it's still before the trade deadline when we talk. But yes. here's, here is, you know, here is my uh, answer for that. It was something to think about, chew on for a week, right? I say trade him. The next question, well, what are you going to do? You know, this and that and everything. Paul Skeens for the next year and a half. Let him learn is- how to be a... Let him learn how to be a major leaguer while being a closer for a bad team. So, which means he comes out, he throws at 103 miles an hour. People say, well, he's a starter. He's a starter. Yeah, you can stretch him out, you know, but in year two or three, instead of having languish in the minor leagues against guys that he can overpower and overwhelm with his stuff because he's, you know, because of what he has, how about let him learn how to get major leaguers out for a year and a half, like they did with, you know, they did it with David Price. I mean, there's been a number of starters who started, you know, they're, they're big-time starters that started their career in the bullpen. 
to me, when you got a guy that throws 103 and can overwhelm people, if you put him in double A or where is he starting? Single A, high A or whatever, it's silly. All right? Yeah, the, to me, let him learn how to pitch to major league pit, major league hitters by being, you know, in the majors and do so in a role that, yeah, eventually it's going to be important, but for the next year and a half, it probably isn't going to be that all that important. So if he blows a few saves, who cares? Well, I'll, I'll, this is what I'd say to that, Paul, is I'd have concern that that what's, what's going to happen with – what's happened with David Bednar this season is going to happen with him where he might not pitch for a week. And is that good <laughs> for a guy's development, you know, especially if you're going to ramp but, him back but, up and have but, him throw the book of innings. But like I said, Adam, like I would tell you, Adam, the difference between him and Bednar is Bednar is a closer. He's a guy you, – okay, so you go two or three days and it looks like, okay, well, you know, we haven't won a game or whatever – you could put him in as a middle reliever, you know, let him pitch two or three innings in a bat, you know, in a low leverage situation. You could get him work is what I'm saying, because, you know, you're not holding him as he's got to be our closer. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I just wonder if, I wonder if that's how they're, I think they're going to end up in like <laughs> the gloves, at least for this season. I think if we're It'll going to never happen. Big, yeah, I think if we're going into opening day next year, though, Paul, and we're still talking about you, you using kid gloves, I think that's a conversation that has to be had. But I just he's thrown so many innings this year, and you got to get him ramped back up. I question if that's going to happen in enough time. Okay, I can live with that. But my point is this idea that somehow with Bednar, first of all, if you trade him, and, okay, so you lose your closer off this team. Who cares? I mean, really. At the end of the day, you've got enough arms. Somebody can do the last three, you know, last three outs if you need to. But for me, I mean, I would say if you're looking for somebody to throw out there, at least for a year, well, you got one. He happens to throw at 103. I mean, it, it certainly is, is a, an idea worth considering. Paul, we are going to have a trade deadline extravaganza next week. I look forward to talking to you about all these guys and, and the potential deals that they'll make. But in the meantime, I'm going to sign off and just uh, – that was a good tease, Paul. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. We'll see, you, we'll see you soon. Talk to you all again next week. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.